The intentional process of radical social change demands continual tension and crisis. In the book Readings in Social Psychology by Theodore Newcomb and Eugene Hartley, published in 1937, we see the formulations of modern change theory and practice defined for educators. Researcher Barrett Keough states, and this is a quote, this book helped lay the foundation for the psychosocial strategies that have transformed education and culture around the world. Based on the research begun at Tavistock in England, continued at the Frankfurt Institute in Germany, then moved to MIT, Columbia University, Stanford, and other tax-funded educational laboratories, as they were referred to after World War II, it established the strategies for brainwashing that now permeates our schools, media, and organizations." End quote. Kenneth Goff, a member of the U.S. Communist Party in his heyday of the 30s and 40s, remarked that we were trained in all phases of warfare, both psychological and physical, for the destruction of the capitalistic society and Christian civilization. Raymond Houghton, in his book, To Nurture Humaneness, said this, quote, Absolute behavior control is imminent. The critical point of behavior control, in effect, is sneaking up on mankind without his self-conscious realization that a crisis is at hand. Man will never self-consciously know that it has happened." End quote. What is the dialectic method and how is it used to build consensus and change? Is it a form of subtle brainwashing? What part has the entertainment industry played in advocating change? Stay tuned for my conversation with cultural analyst and commentator Jay Dyer, but be forewarned, your perspective on what constitutes reality is about to undergo a radical transformation. Remember that your failure to be informed does not make me a wacko. Well, the time has come, the walrus said, to talk of other things. Of shoes and chips and ceiling wax and cabbages and kings. My mind doesn't work that way. I got this real moron thing I do. It's called thinking. And I'm not a very good American because I like to form my own opinions. I have certain rules I live by. My first rule, I don't believe anything the government tells me. And I don't take very seriously the media or the press in this country. Toto? We're not in Kansas anymore. Nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Hello, and welcome to Soaring Eagle Radio. Your host is Mike Spaulding. Get ready to be challenged and encouraged as you consider today's news and Mike's commentary from a biblical perspective. Now, let's join Mike. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Soaring Eagle radio program. I'm your host, Mike Spaulding. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes. You can follow us on Facebook and, of course, uh, Twitter, at Soaring Eagle Rad. I'm welcoming Jay Dyer to the program tonight. Jay is a writer and researcher. He holds a BA in philosophy with uh, graduate work focusing on literary theory, espionage, and philosophy. And that's rather a very interesting combination. His research is published on his website, jaysanalysis.com, and has appeared on numerous alternative media outlets across the Internet. Welcome to the Soaring Eagle Radio Show, Jay. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. I found your research through a, a mutual friend and uh, began to, to look into what you have published on your website and, and some of the podcasts and just fascinated and and uh, what I'll describe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'll describe as your life's work and, uh, and, and really what you are very good at analyzing. And uh, so tonight I wanted to talk about the dialectic method, exactly what it is, how that's related to mind control, if at all, and then how does the entertainment complex use that 
to do brainwashing. So it's really surprising to me the number of people uh, who've never heard of the dialectic method of change. In fact, I was talking to someone uh, today just before um, uh, the program, and they had never heard of the term, the dialectic method. Could you describe it in layman's terms what, what uh, philosopher Hegel proposed in his dialectic method, Jay? I can. I'd be glad to. And I would also point out that since you and your listeners are fans of theology, throughout my 20s, that was my main focus. So if anybody's interested in uh, essays, pieces, articles related to historical theology or medieval theology and philosophy or patristic theology and philosophy, which was uh, my focus, especially in my I did do a brief stint in a seminary and Bible college, so my focus there was patristic theology. So if anybody's interested in that, they can go into the archives. I have a section at the top that's uh, philosophy and theos, or theology. Excellent, excellent. And, you know, you'll see a lot of articles there that might pique your interest. But on the topic of Hegel, that's a great place to start because Hegel is – probably the most well-known representative figure of German idealism. And without going too far into historical, uh, the history of ideas, if we think about uh, German idealism, well, we think of people like uh, Fichte, we think of uh, Schelling, we think of Hegel, we think of Kant. And these are Enlightenment-era figures who place a tremendous emphasis on reason. But they're, they're distinct from their counterparts in the British realm of philosophy that were their contemporaries, people like Hume, mm -hmm. Kant, yeah. and Berkeley. So they focus on empiricism. The German idealists, obviously, by that very title, focus on idealism. So we have to start there and understand what that is. And for a layman, idealism is the idea that when we look out in the world and we see objects out there and we have the phenomena of experience, there's different ways that we might categorize all of that. And for the British people of this time, the empiricists, their tendency was to say, well, those are just experiences that hit us on one realm, right? They, they hit us on the realm of the five senses, and that's it. And, you know, there may be other things out there like God or spirit, angels or whatever, but as far as we know, we can only tap into things that touch us on the level of the five senses, and that's called empiricism. Yes. Now, over against that is the school roughly titled idealism. And idealism is the opposite. It says, no, we have these sensations, these sense impressions, these things that come to us through sight, sound, smell, etc. But that's not the totality of reality. The totality of reality is actually ideal. It's conceptual. It's the psyche, that's what reality is really all about. That's what is the fundamental structure or fabric of reality is in some way ideals or, uh, or excuse me, ideas or forms. So this is more so in line with Plato and Platonism. Platonism is a brand, is a form of idealism. And so that's where we put Hegel. And so what Hegel says in his radical idealism is that to, he says basically he's in there. I don't want to get too off track, but you can be an empiricist idealist. There is such a thing as that. So there's a there are always anomalies. So yes. George uh, Barclay was an empiricist idealist. So he thought that sense impression was all that there was, but all the sense impressions were ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of true of Hegel in the sense that he thinks that to be is to be perceived. He would he would agree with that that notion from Berkeley, Berkeley. and th the most famous dictum for understanding Hegel is the real is the rational and the rational is the real. Mm -hmm. And that means essentially that whatever's out there in the world, it's not when you go out there and you, you knock on the wood, you, you, you touch the tree, you touch the ground, you're receiving the impression, the sensation of it being solid. But solidity in these kinds of things are just ideas. These are these are ideals, and all of reality is encapsulated into the realm of the ideal. Yeah. So it's all psyche. So in a way, we could call it panpsychism. Mm -hmm. And so for Hegel, reality is not, you know, we're so used to things from the Newtonian perspective of, you know, 
yeah. uh, of gravity and, and cause and, and effect and all yeah. that. It's very different for Hegel and in, in that mindset. For Hegel, all of reality is spirit, Geist in the in the German, mm-hmm. and it's in a process of movement and attainment towards self consciousness. So for Hegel, all of reality is psyche, and what we're seeing in history is the outplaying of the self-realization of psyche. So quite literally for Hegel, all reality and all objects in reality, be they animate or inanimate, are participating in this process of self-realization of the absolute or of the spirit or of the ideal. Mm -hmm. Now, that is called roughly process philosophy, and this Mm -hmm. is the key. Because process philosophy will also have its form in the British thinkers with people like Alfred North Whitehead and in some degree Bertrand Russell uh, and the Royal Society thinkers because they will latch on to a lot of this process philosophy as will Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. They will just simply dispense with all that idealism. So Mm -hmm. they'll toss out all the formal conceptual abstractions and the idea of, of Plato's formalism, yeah. and they'll just, as it's famously said about Marx, they'll stand Hegel on his head. And by that, <laughs> by that it's meant yeah. to, to suggest that, yeah, there's all this process and there's all this uh, dialectical interchange and movement towards this, uh, the synthesis, which I'll explain here in a second. Yeah. But that's all just matter. Mm. Right? And that's yeah. where the, Marx and the, and the Royal Society will take this, this school of thought. But real quickly, back to Hegel. So what he did, and I was brushing up before we got on here. I hadn't looked at Phenomenology of the Spirit in a long time. So I was <laughs> brushing up, looking yeah. at this thing. And I've got all these notes in it from back in my undergrad days. And yeah. This thing, I mean, my view, personal view of Hegel is that he's at, at the same time the most insightful and interesting guy and then at the same time, the most gobbledygook nonsense guy. <laughs> so half the time, you I don't care who you are or how smart you are, you have the time you're reading this thing, you have no idea what he's talking about, and then you'll get this section where you're like, oh, okay, I think I get what he's saying here. Oh, that's really insightful. And then he goes yeah. right back into it. <laughs> yeah. Jargon and gobbledygook, you have no idea what he's talking about. But, yeah. but we can get a general sense of, of what he's getting at, and it's what I've said so far. And... Uh, Commentators, uh, secondary sources on Hegel have roughly sketched out that it's triadic. So what Hegel did was take the theology of the Trinity, Trinitarianism and triadism, and he sort of philosophized it, and he just sort of collapsed it into the realm of the ph- of phenomena, right, which is mm-hmm. the phenomenon of human experience. Yeah. And there are, there are all these triads everywhere, and what we have to do is understand that the triadic process is dialectical so he would say something to the effect of when you come into a room and you see a chair and that's the first time that you've seen a chair well that's a new phenomena for you because it's the first time you've seen that chair it's also a new phenomena for the chair and so this process of you and the chair in this dialogue, if you're not, if you're not completely insane talking to chairs or something. Like right. Uh, this is actually a real philosophical metaphysical process where both you and this chair in this exchange of knowledge are being raised to a higher level of, of being, which is, that is closer to the, the final state of uh, absolute self-consciousness or the omega point or whatever we want to call it. Yeah. So this dialectical exchange is going on consistently throughout everybody's lives and throughout the whole of history. So Hegel has a completely wide scope, wide sweeping, universal philosophy at work here. Now, that dialectical process is across the board. So this applies to everything from politics to theology to Mm -hmm. nature to art to aesthetics Mm -hmm. to history, whatever whatever you want to say. And this is where it applies to Marxism. So hey, uh, Marx comes along, and after being influenced by these uh, German atheists like Feuerbach, uh, Marx says, I, I like a lot of this, this German idealism. He was one of the young Hegelians, which is a movement uh, in Germany at that time, a philosophical movement. But he decides that through the influence of Feuerbach and these other German atheists, that, that all this spirit talk is a bunch of BS. That's yeah. all nonsense. Yeah. 
throw that out. Yeah. And so this is, of course, after the influence of the British empiricists like Hume and, and uh, uh, Locke and others that I mentioned. And what they would do is also dispense with a lot of this metaphysics. Yeah. So Marx is coming along as a German, influenced by the German idealists, as well as by the British empiricists and the British empiri- and, and, and the later British philosophy of Darwinism. So this is crucial for Marxism. You can't understand Marx without understanding right. Darwinian process in terms of biology. Yes. And ultimately, I think it's a mythology. And then combined with Hegelian philosophy and idealism and its process, just minus all the metaphysical baggage. Right. Yes. Right. Yep. So that's what Marx does. Marx takes this triadic structure, this dialectical process, and he says this is what this is right about the world or a right descriptor of our experience but our experience is in in hegel it's alienated from real life from daily life this is too much speculation too much mm-hmm. armchair stuff with hegel yeah so marx says what we've actually got to do is engage in praxis you can't just have theory I mean, hegel's all theory Where's the praxis? And the yeah. praxis for Mark is man's daily life. Mm-hmm. And man is alienated from other men and from nature due to the existing belief systems and structures that are uh, in play uh, in his day. Yeah. So <clears throat> Marx will be instrumental in what we will call historical materialism. So historical mm-hmm. materialism is the the... Marxism that develops out of more more so directly out of Marx and Engels. There's a competing view uh, that was popular in the Eastern Bloc, known as di- uh, dialectical materialism. So the difference between his histmat and diamat, as they're called in the history of Marxism, is that Marxist historical materialism was posited this idea that history is 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 a determined process that is exemplifying these stages and these stages are, are coming and going. And so we had the, the feudal era, then we had Adam Smith and, and the, and the capitalist revolution. And then we had industrial revolution. And so Marx at that point, at that stage, he was thinking, well, so there's these other stages that are coming. There's going to be a stage of a world state communism. And then there will be the stage of, absolute freedom the withering away of the state so a lot of people don't know this but marx was actually ultimately a libertarian he thought that the state would eventually wither away because the industrial revolution would eventually make it so that technology and machinery would basically do away with the need for labor Mm -hmm. and this would create a state where man would be able to freely you wake up in the morning go out and paint and you can go fishing, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So it's very, it's still very idealistic, right? I mean, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Marxists will differ on whether or not uh, Karl Marx himself actually thought that it was determined with certainty that this stage would come or whether he just thought these stage were, stages were possible. Yeah. Now, the other school of the Stalinists and the Eastern Bloc, known as dialectical materialism, they thought that rather that they didn't really like this idea of the state withering away. <laughs> so, right. exactly. so they thought, no, actual uh, world state international communism is the final state. That's it. That's where we get to. And that's what will bring about you know the worker's paradise and the utopia and all that. That's the best hope we've got. So... So those are two rival schools, and both of these schools don't work out too well, you know, historically. They, they result in mass death, yeah. chaos, yeah. because ultimately they're, I believe, uh, technologies or tools of reorganization of society and yeah. redis- redistribution of wealth. That's right, ultimately right. what I think socialism and, and communism and whatever its forms and flavors are, yes. that's, what it, that's what it achieves. It also achieves a lot of death mass cash mass casualties so yeah. so <clears throat> with darwinism and with marx 
and with Freud is what you you have a complete revolution in anthropology in social order and in academia and in science so every, everything has changed uh, from its medieval and, and prior early medieval incarnations of, of how the West viewed itself and viewed social order everything's turned on its head and that's we now live in that sort of that era of the you know the cusp of basically I believe the, the death of the Enlightenment idealism now the yeah. reason I say that is because this is where the Frankfurt School comes in so at the time of following World War two uh, after you know two world wars it started dawning on all these idealistic Marxists that it's not looking too good right? <laughs> we're not yes. actually getting towards this work right. paradise that we thought could come where are we going in history so mm -hmm. Theodore Adorno and, and Max Horkheimer wrote a famous book called Dialectic of Enlightenment, and they kind of take a Nietzschean turn in their philosophy where they say, you know what, the great man, the new man of the of the communist mythology, that ain't coming out of the people. It's mm -hmm. not the workers that are going to be the new man. Because mm -hmm. these, these uh, proletariat don't seem to care about all these abstruse terms and neologisms that you know mm -hmm. these marxists are throwing away they're they're they've workers right they they're worried about when the lunch break's coming they're not worried yeah. about the term that lenin used versus trotsky yeah so they kind of got a little more realistic view of human nature and they transition into critiquing culture and the culture industry so there's actually a lot of insights in in the book i mean obviously i don't support cultural marxism or the frankfurt school per se but it is interesting from a conspiratorial perspective where they say look it, monopolistic capitalism is just as bad mm -hmm. right i mean and that's yeah. kind of true right yeah. because what do we have well this is what gives us you know Katy perry lady gaga and this, yes. this pseudo culture that we have that's all that's not it might be in in display cultural Marxism, but at the top, it's run by billion dollar conglomerates. That's right. So there's insights in that book. So I, it's, a, it's another love hate scenario when we look at Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of the Enlightenment. But and they were both associated with the Frankfurt School, weren't they, Jay? Yeah, they were major Frankfurt School thinkers, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, another I have, last summer I read uh, another one of these characters, the Jürgen Habermas book, Theory and Praxis. And he's a, he's another one of these later, he's kind of the, the more modern version, of, the more up-to-date version of Horkheimer and Adorno. They were writing at the time of World War II. And Habermas is a little more contemporary. I think Habermas even had some debate with Ratzinger or somebody at some point. Uh, I don't, okay. It doesn't really matter, but... Yeah. But uh, he, he's a little more contemporary, um, which I have a really neat quote that I want to read from that. Uh, but I don't want to get too too far off course here because <laughs> because this is this is good. But yeah. so, for example, there's a book, a treatise that to just to bring this into more practical realms. There's a treatise that Engels wrote called "The Part Played by Labor in the Transition from Ape to Man." Mm -hmm. Now this was written in the mid or in uh, spring of 1876, and when we look at these treatises, what we see is that these these Marxists, early Marxists, were actually setting the stage for what would become the Green Movement. Yes, that's and right. a lot of people don't know this that the Green Movement comes out of Marxist thinkers. Yes, uh, it's it's some people said well there were national socialists who had the same idea yeah they did because mm -hmm. actually national socialism was influenced by marxism <laughs> right that's right <laughs> it was also influenced by darwinism mm -hmm. so yes. if i recall das kapital is has an intro where it's dedicated to darwin yes that's uh, correct and the the national socialists as well thought that they could co-opt the phenomena of darwinian progress into their philosophy so you know that Different Baskin Robbins, thirty-one, thirty-two flavors is really what this is—the <laughs> same ice cream. Yeah, it's deadly ice cream, though. Right? Yes, that's um, right. That's prim right. Primal soup flavored ice cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, so, to give some concrete examples of how dialectical materialism 
or historical material. These are all just academic debates anyway. How, how is this dialectical process incarnated into our experience and used as a technique? Well, there's all kinds of ways we could look at that. The first thing that came to mind to me was the green agenda. So mm -hmm. we might have, as a result of industrialization and corporate greed and you know all these these uh, slogans of the left we there might actually be situations where there's real environmental problems so what happens is the system comes along looks for trends looks for pro real problems and what they do is they don't want to solve the problem per se but what they do like to do is give a solution that appears to be directed at a real problem yes. that serves a future design of the system itself. Mm -hmm. And I view the green agenda this way. So there, there are situations where there may be real environmental problems. And when you look at the green agenda and you find out that, oh, actually BP, Dutch Royal Shell, the, these big oil conglomerates are very much invested in the green movement. Yes, yeah, so that, that, might, that might shock some people to, to hear that statement, Jay. Well, it, it, it may. And but I assure you, you can find white papers. In fact, a couple months ago, I was doing some research on this, and I found some white papers from Shell where they were actually talking about uh, how they were moving towards going green and how much they wanted to be involved in the green movement. And the whole history of the green movement, back to the Club of Rome, you can pull up the famous document, The First Global Revolution. And, and they talk about in that treatise, from the, which is a European think tank, they talk about in that treatise that they want to create the new – problem what, what is the new problem that we can unite everybody around yes. and they point to the environment yes and the environment is going to be because that's the unifying fact what does everybody share right mm -hmm. we don't all share yeah. the same religion we don't all share the same language or ethnic, but we all have this the same situation of being in some environment right yeah. we all have nature around us in some way yeah. so it makes it makes for a great unifying so-called threat to say that uh ultimately that man is the problem and that's what that club of rome document actually says it says that we will it literally says man is the problem so it allows for movement towards a you know un maurice strong global green agenda blah on and on and on all these yeah. all these your carbon tax uh, population sustain, control. sustainability uh, yeah. population control all of yeah. those things that we've heard so many times yeah is all classed under this this green movement and it all goes back to marx and dialectical materialism yeah. so the corporate strategy of implement and, and the green agenda is a corporate sales strategy that's what's important to understand it's a pr marketed thing and that's why you see all these corporations adopt it yes you know, like we're green now green mm -hmm. energy green you know the energy saving it's it's yes. on all the washing machines and dryers now you know, it's, yeah. this is an energy saving smart device right yeah that's yeah. all all tied together intentionally yeah and so that's that's a corporate example of dialectics being used so in, in the religious realm the of course the rockefellers helped start the world council of churches and yes the united nations and they wanted to tie the religious aspect into unesco and all that and so what they did was the early rockefeller uh, I think senior, he, he, he got sick of this sort of old line evangelical stuff that he believed in, and I like the idea of the social gospel. So Rockefeller senior was instrumental in promoting the, the theology that was prevalent in early 20th century Protestant liberalism and evangelical liberalism in the U S known as the social gospel. And the social gospel ties in well with Marxism. Yes. Thus, you know, uh, uh, liberation theology from Latin America and so forth. Okay, so so the social gospel uh, was was really funded and advanced by uh, by the Rockefellers. Yeah, according to their authorized biography, yes, that's exactly what uh, yeah. Collier and Horvitz say in that book. Well, that's a whole another uh, topic for another show. I'm sure we could we could discuss yeah, the, well, uh, I, uh, the goals, the foundations, right. and all that. That'd be sure, very interesting. Not meant to go off sometime. topic, but I appreciate it. Oh, no, no, bring it up no, because no, no. that no, fits that's... into the, yes, what the absolutely. World Council of Churches will promote. So <clears throat> this is an example of dialectical brainwashing through the fact that 
Yes. They're coming and they're saying, we got a problem in the world, you know, poverty. We got a problem of, of you know, this or that third world, uh, yeah. you know, and so you guys want to go be missionaries in the third world. Well, you're not actually helping people uh, by preaching all this theology. What you need to do is adopt this new strategy of, of social gospel, which is actually just a, a policy for implementing, you know, strategies of the think tanks is old, really old, what it amounts to. Yeah. So that's what the, that's, that's why the right. Rockefeller yeah. Foundation promotes social gospel. So, yeah. if, if for our listeners, Jay, I just I just want to mention a couple of names uh, in connection with the social gospel. You need to think of people like Jim Wallace from uh, Sojourners. Uh, he he is an avowed Marxist. He makes no secret about that. Uh, Tony Campolo uh, is also a, a self-proclaimed socialist. Um, you have people like uh, Brian McLaren uh, associated with the, I don't even know if you could call it a movement anymore, but the, the uh, emergent church yes. Uh, yes. movement. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it a movement anymore. It's just... It's, Kind of amorphous, hard to get your hands around anymore. But it it all goes back to this liberal liberation kind of theology that, that really denies the central tenets of uh, Christian theism. But anyway, I, I just wanted my listeners to understand uh, who you're talking about when you're talking about social gospel today. Yeah, and they these foundations and and families were instrumental in promoting these things, not just in Protestant and evangelical circles, but also amongst Roman Catholics. So I, I spent quite a bit of yes. time in my 20s as a student of Roman Catholicism, and uh, I attended yes. Mass, actually, for about eight years. Mm -hmm. And what you what you come to <clears throat> find out is that the Jesuits were really the focal point of where that infiltrated the Roman Catholic Church. And so most of the Latin American uh, liberation theologians were, were Jesuits, and yeah. they had a, a big influence up to the time of Vatican II and in crafting the Vatican II uh, documents. So that's a whole other thing. But but you have to understand that's, that's how wide scope it is. And so when we talk about right. liberation theology, we have to understand we're talking Marxism and we're talking dialectics. That's, that's what right. it is. It's, yeah. a, it's a process, yeah. process philosophy, mm -hmm. process theology, and <laughs> process brainwashing, right? <laughs> Operation yeah, brainwashing. Right. So that's right. Uh, in let's see, political sphere. Well, we can think of Obama. Obama is a great example. Uh, he runs on this platform yeah. of uh, progressivism and all this sloganeering and baloney. And really, what yeah. he is is a, a corporate uh, pitch man, a PR man, a, a, a CEO, more or less, kind of a kind of that kind of a car salesman, sort of like that yeah. kind of a guy. Yeah. And yeah. his job is to continually be this focal point of attention to divert from anything real. And, and it's always about race and gender. Uh, yes. That's that's the especially with race. And then if we get Hillary, it'll be gender. And so yeah, what these right. these are emblems or icons or, or images of what is a perceived problem. Right. Well, there's all this racial oppression. There's all this gender oppression. Mm -hmm. There's there's the thesis, the antithesis, and then what well, what's the synthesis? Well, the synthesis will be adopting all these new ideas, right? The Obama ran mm -hmm. on the program of forward on change, right? Of these actual Maoist slogans. Yeah. So yeah. that's a political example. Another political example would be bombing a region and coming in through Halliburton right? and rebuilding the region. Yeah. Oh my, yes, chaos yeah. and then you know, mm -hmm. chaos. So. So these are examples, uh, and, and it's important to understand that they're real strategies. You know, you have people That's in right. the think tanks, you have people at the Pentagon, military strategists, military industrial company. These guys ran corporation. They strategize these very things, and they are strategies. Yeah. Yeah, that they may sound crazy that there's people out there that really think this way, but it's it's partly game theory. It's partly, you know, we think about uh, strategy of tension. We think about Bernard Lewis, who's a, who's influenced the neocons in the U.S. Bernard Lewis is a British thinker, and he mm -hmm. writes about this idea that he's the one that, that termed coined the term clash of civilizations. Is it fair to uh, make a connection between uh, a, a combination of politics and and race? 
within this dialectical process and, and think of situations like um, Ferguson and, and, and Baltimore, it, it, is it fair to make that analysis that it's, it's part, and I'm not saying that there wasn't anything organic about uh, either of those situations, but I think they were seized upon and, and used to further and bring about a synthesis. Is that is that fair to oh, make absolutely. that assessment? Absolutely. I, I, if you go to Jay's analysis, you type in ISIS, you'll see an a archive of articles on that. And one of the pieces that I did okay. is called ISIS Feminists and Thugs, hmm. dupes of the, of the foundations and think tanks. And what I point out there in that piece is the very point you just made, that uh, those are stellar examples of the phenomena where – the, the foreign policy strategy that we mentioned a minute ago of, say, bombing someplace and then, say, with Syria, so ISIS supposedly is this organic Islamic state that rises up and they're fighting, uh, Assad, they want to take down Assad. And so formerly we, we wanted to take down Assad, but now we want to help Assad fight ISIS when in actuality, of course, we, the U.S. and the, the administration has, has been behind ISIS in my view. Uh, and right, so, right. so what happens? Well, we got to have the solution of coming in to fight ISIS, and then of course they'll probably take down Assad after that. <laughs> At least that's the goal. Right. So, <laughs> so that's a great example of it. But so that that's a foreign policy example of cr control chaos and strategy of tension. That same strategy, I argue, is what's used domestically. It's no different. So domestically, you have these yeah. examples of. Feminine, feminist liberation movements and these radical displays of, you know, women bearing their breasts and running around and acting insane. Yeah. Or you have the Ferguson, Baltimore uh, protesters. We know that uh, Soros put $33 million into those protests. And what they do is they provocateur. And, and so you have all this mm -hmm. marketing and this, these strategies of ethnography that are targeted at different people groups to sell them on riling them up and, and getting involved in is basically duping people through a bunch of provocateurs and the provocateurs yes. go in and they, and they have all these slogans and they, they're, they're demagogues to get everybody riled up. And then it, it gives the impression of this great uh, tension, this, this social unrest, right? And, and yeah. what does yeah. that lead to? Well, save your government comes in, save your system comes in and says, Oh, all these problems, yeah. oh, we will save you. We will save. You. Yes. So <laughs> yeah. So yeah. and that's it's the same with the foreign policy as it is domestically. Yeah. When people think of um, mind control, Jay, they think of some dark, diabolical, uh, you know, locked away Jason Bourne kind of uh, uh, reprogramming and disconnecting uh, someone from reality. But really, it it doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, as I think about the dialectical method and, and what you've been describing here across the spectrum of politics, uh, religion, domestic policy, I think it's a form or it's being used uh, a, a, as a form or a way of very subtle, uh, very low-key mind control because it does shape people's opinions, perspectives, and it does it through the emotion by bypassing the, the brain, doesn't it? Yes, it's geared towards – a lot of it uses the older ideas of Pavlov and, and these different psychologists in terms of what they call operant conditioning. Yeah. And it's the application of methods of animal testing to humans. And that's sort of the origins of it, monkey studies and animal studies and so forth, and then transferring that into the human domain and applying it in all sorts of settings. So – it's a scientific process. That's what's important to understand. So is it nefarious yeah. and dark? Yes and no. It's both of those things. There were, if you, yeah. from what we know at least, and of course, anytime there's, I've got a bunch of books on MKUltra and all those documents and all that. We, we, we don't know in, this, in the general public how much of this is actually just controlled release. So I tend to think in agreement with some other thinkers that what we know, these are probably controlled releases. It probably is probably much worse than, than what we know because we only know a little bit. But from what we know right. and what we can kind of parcel out from the published works from people like Ewan Cameron or Jose Delgado and these different well-known um, sci psychologists that were employed by the CIA to be involved in these, in these tests and these techniques, 
what we do know is that it's a scientific process that would operate under the guise, the shell, of psychiatric work. So you and Cameron, for example, was involved in all kinds of the nefarious stuff. He actually did do the nefarious stuff, according to, according to yeah. what we know. But the but the real power of it is not that. It's not the the mind controlled assassin with the trigger words that's going to come blow your head out off or something like that. Yeah. The real application of it is to the social sphere, and so the real application is mm-hmm. is mass social engineering through advertising, through television, through mass media. Yes. That's what MKUltra really is. And that's why it's yeah. important, uh, far less so for the more fanciful, sensational stories of the assassins or whatever. Although I do yeah. tend to think that there's there's some truth to that. That's just yeah. my opinion. So when you're talking about, uh, you, you touched on something, and, and this is it's perhaps a little bit off, uh, off track, but I, I think it relates. You're talking about that uh, mind control really through uh, advertising, which is when you boil it all down, it's it's just propaganda, isn't it? Yeah, I had a graduate class that was a graduate level class that was uh, in my undergrad that was what was it? Social wasn't social theory, sociology and social theory, I think is what it was. Anyway, but uh, yeah. we'd spent a lot of time in that class reading all of these guys, reading the social theorists and University of Chicago, which is actually sort of the birthplace of sociology as a suddenly it's a science. Right. And I, I mean, I kind of <laughs> think it's a pseudoscience, but I, I kind of think it's insightful at times because it gives you an idea about what the system is actually doing and what they're interested in. So when you read these yes. guys like Emil Durkheim and these different social theorists, you get a, a sense mm-hmm. of how they wanted to re-engineer society. And we did a lot of research on advertising and marketing in that class. And so once you start to deconstruct ads, you can start mm-hmm. to notice the patterns and the techniques yep. the, the, it, that is exactly what you're talking about. So it's, it's, all, it's always intended to be very base, very simple, and very reactionary. So you want to appeal mm-hmm. to people on a very simple level. That's why ads are always just slogans. It's nothing in depth, nothing to think too critically about it's always about presentation it's always about selling something it's always it's always an appeal to like you said heartstrings and immediate reactions so it's not about yeah stopping to critically think and that's why mass media and advertising is structured such that it's a constant bombardment it's it's a never yeah. stop constant ads constant movement constant changing screens images on the screen constantly changing very different from mm-hmm. sitting and reading and that's why that's we're right. moving away from reading because reading actually is very important for the mind to to process and to to chew on a thing there's actually you know in the old days even back to the 40s and 50s i've seen uh, lectures from philosophers back in the 40s and 50s on how to read a book <laughs> And they'll even right. talk in these lectures about how <laughs> what you need to do is that you first read the text and then go and, uh, you know, chew on it. <laughs> Come back yes. to the text, reread. <laughs> I mean, how foreign is that from today? I mean, just, right. You don't even hear anything like that today. So, no. Uh, so, yeah, that's what that's how to understand MK Ultra is to understand it as as mass advertising and that's why so many of these CIA guys come out of the advertising world and they go into the OSS and the CIA later on and because they had the sense of uh, being good pitchmen good salesmen for for selling ideas right i mean it's not just um, it, it's it's trafficking Trafficking in ideologies is really what, what's a big yes. part of this, and so, so that's what M culture is ultimately. They, I mean, why was, why do you, why worry so much about a, a trigger word assassin, right? I mean, you could just mm-hmm. for assassins, you just hire some guys a hitman. <laughs> there yes, are real right. hitmen in the world. <laughs> and there's mafia people yes. out there. Why do you need to fool with mind control assassins? So, yeah, that yeah. that's the key. I think is to understanding that it's the entirety of the the media, mass media complex itself that is the, the real heart of, of MK Ultra. Yeah. And we see, and, uh, and I know you've done a lot of research on this. In fact, on your website, Jay, you have a, 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 
page or a tab devoted specifically to uh, analysis of movies. And you go into great detail. In fact, I'll just uh, say this now for our listeners. Uh, if, if you are interested in uh, uh, very clear, very analytical, and uh, uh, very precise uh, movie analysis, you need to go to Jay's uh, website and, and check out what he has to say about movies. Um, and, and I say that from experience. I've done that already myself. So uh, when it comes to the entertainment industry, Jay, how do they use these techniques that we've been talking about to shape people's opinions, uh, to move their values to different places? Um, in America today, we've seen a, a huge shift uh, just in this generation uh, to a place that many of us never thought we would see. The, the entertainment industry has played a large uh, part in that. Can, can you speak to that for our listeners? Absolutely. I, I think it's the pivot point. That's really how we got here so fast. Um, I, in fact, even yeah. from the time I graduated high school in 1997, and from what I've seen from age 18 to now, it blows me away. The, 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 yeah. the, the <laughs> immense changes. I, I know that every supposedly, you know, every generation says that. Well, I can't believe how much things have changed. But I think it's it's this right. is unique. This is not it's not like anything else in history. Precisely because we've never had in history the kinds of things that we have now, like mass media and internet and Hollywood and all that. That didn't exist, you know, yeah. 200 years ago. So. So it's it's not just like every other era in history or whatever. It's very unique, right. and Hollywood is the new source of of our stories. And I've pointed mm -hmm. this out so many times that human beings don't want to hear bureaucrats leading, listing facts. That's very boring. So mm -hmm. that's why yeah. the, part of the reason that the communist uh, dictators didn't do so well historically is that you know they would they would have so much control over the arts and and forbid so many things and have party mandates yeah. for the arts that they didn't realize that you needed to construct the arts. Well, I, I, some of them actually did. They would have communist plays and all that, but, but they weren't as good as Hollywood. And that's why, you know, that, right. that's the main thing is that, so it's an old strategy. It's what elites have known for a long time. You can go back to the ancient Greeks and the way that they speak about the theater and the Dromanon and it being the, retelling of the stories of the gods and or look at something like Virgil's Aeneid. I had an excellent graduate class on the Aeneid and we, we looked at it from all different angles. And, and what the Aeneid was was actually state propaganda. So that was actually written as hmm. the, the, the mythology of the Roman Empire. Virgil was uh, patronized to, to write that as the mythology of the Roman Empire. And that would then go out, you know, to be a play or to be read as how this group, this, this empire would, would understand itself, its own story. Uh, and so yeah. we have to understand that this is an old technique. It's, it's not new. Hollywood is new in the way that it does things in its medium, but the, this basic idea is not new. It's an old idea. So yeah. What Hollywood is then is our new myth maker. It's our new mythology. It's our new storytelling apparatus that gives us mm -hmm. the way to interpret reality. And that's much more effective, yeah. like I said, than you know your local senator getting up there and telling a bunch of facts about employment and unemployment. It, that's very boring. Nobody cares about that. Yes, but everybody wants to go right. see the Terminator. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I just got the idea that it would be neat to have a site that did uh, – a reading of film and the way that you you kind of do literature analysis in in college or if you've had film classes you, you kind of do this kind of analysis in, yeah. in your classes yeah. so i thought it'd be neat for a for a site because that's that's really a focal point that that you reach people through people you know there's all kinds of alternative media sites that talk about government policies all day and that's fine but you know you really want to meet people on the ground uh, that that's that was why I did it, you know, it's a, yeah. and it's just a reflection of my interest. So, mm -hmm. so that's what Hollywood is, and that's why I write on those subjects. Plus, I actually like film quite a bit. I, I find it to be a really neat uh, form of, of aesthetics. Yeah, and, and, and digging in there and finding all of these things, 
uh, I couldn't help but smile when you said nobody wants to listen to a bureaucrat talk about statistics or what the government is going to do <laughs> or not do. But if they hide that in a message in a movie, mm -hmm. it's much more interesting. It is, and that's a technique, too, of conditioning. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to paint everything in a negative light. I mean, sometimes it's just creative people like to play play with their artwork. You know, they like to put things in there. Sure. Uh, but it also can have a nefarious use. It can have a use in terms of psychological warfare and conditioning, getting people used to the idea of uh, new morals uh, or lack thereof yeah. Uh, yeah. of the transition out of older ways of living into the new way and so in other words religion and the arts is is the focal point of how the establishment really wants to re-engineer everyone yeah and that's why hollywood and theology are important and why they actually do have quite a bit of connection between the two because they're they're from the establishment's perspective that's get them there we need to get them there especially especially get the youth there yes yeah. How important is uh, symbolism in, in movies, Jay? It's very important. It's it's in philosophy. We have a branch of philosophy called uh, semiotics, and that's the study of signs and symbols. And mm -hmm. that's very much what the arts are. The arts are signs and symbols of our life, of history, of religion, of whatever things humans find meaningful in life, their culture. So yeah. even in this process right now, you know, I'm using sounds coming out of my vocal cords that then are interpreted by your ears and your listeners ears that goes into their head and they're understood within some framework or context of meaning and all of life is really this way i mean when we when we look out and we see the world in our visual spectrum we're actually kind of in a way looking at a bunch of signs and symbols now i'm not saying that literally the trees and the ground and the grass out there that they're not actual things i'm not saying that but i'm saying that our mind is reading that as oh there is tree that's one tree amongst the class of things that i call trees in that regard all of life is semiotics all of life is symbols that are constantly coming into our frame of vision so crafting stories and arts and music using these tools is again just a reflection of what humans value and what's important in in their culture and their life and that's why it has to be controlled and that's why even plato said that back in the republic that you know the arts have to be controlled by the state because they can be very dangerous to the established order and so that doesn't necessarily mean that the established order doesn't like destructive arts in fact they do yes that's <laughs> our establishment actually likes destructive arts I mean, yes. that's an area where they would disagree with plato would say you can't have any art that might lead to social disorder mm -hmm. our establishment it's quite the opposite they would actually they actually love arts that lead to social yes. disorder not because they want to see things genuinely change for the better because they, they like chaos and destruction so that they can be the saviors yes that's right and uh seize more control and that's what cultural marxism is that that's exactly right that's exactly right. Well, Jay, I think we need to have you back on the show again and uh, pick up on another topic that uh, that I think our our listeners will be very interested in. I know that you sure. you've you've uh, taught or or spoken at length about uh, Hollywood and about uh, the CIA's influence, their presence in Hollywood, and their influence on on movie making. And uh, uh, I think that would be a, a terrific. Uh, show so uh, I'm going to extend an invitation now and we can talk offline about uh, somewhere down the road having you back on and and, and uh, tackling that subject if that's okay yeah it'd be great anytime and, and I, I had some great quotes that I wanted to read that I, I didn't get to I'll save the, save those for the next time okay. yeah awesome are there any new projects you're working on Jay I, I would like you to mention your your website and also that you do have a subscription service right yeah it's uh, it's growing it's trying to get I'm trying to get it to where it's kind of uh, self-sustaining. Uh, and what I do is I offer basically private lectures that I've done from my research into philosophy. So right now I've been going through all of the dialogues of Plato and we're, we're through a, a good bit of them. And I'm three or four books into Plato's Republic. And there's also a bunch of lectures on geopolitics and interviews with people, with authors and things like that. So what I do is if you subscribe, I, I send out, you know, the private links uh, as as I do them. And then I, tr I try to do one a week. Yeah. And uh, so there's also, uh, you know, like I said, there's a 
almost 100 film reviews that readers and listeners can check out. And then on top of that, there's another four or 500 articles that deal with, you know, philosophy, geopolitics, espionage, history, literature, you name it. So there's there's a wealth of, of stuff in the ar archives there to check out. And it's jaysanalysis.com. And you can subscribe or follow me there on Facebook or Twitter or wherever you want to do it. Yeah. And uh, you're on Twitter. What's the handle? What is it? J D underscore O O seven. If you go to the if you go to Jay's analysis, you'll see a, a you'll, Twitter you'll, feed there. Yeah, you'll, you'll see it there. Jay, I appreciate you being on the Soaring Eagle Radio and, and talking about these subjects. Sure. And I, could I say one more thing? Absolutely. Yeah. I also have uh, we'll have in November. I think we'll have a show, kind of roughly through natural news that will be titled Esoteric Hollywood, and then my book will be out next spring which is also titled Esoteric Hollywood. So look for that if you like my film reviews. Yes, Esoteric Hollywood for, for our listeners. You can find that information on Jay's website. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it very Absolutely. much. Song Eagle Radio is a production of Transforming Word Ministries and is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. You may subscribe to the show on iTunes, follow us on Facebook where you can discuss this episode, and follow Soaring Eagle Radio on Twitter at Soaring Eagle Rad. And listen to every episode from our website, www.soaringeagleradio.com. The opening audio montage collection was created by Micah 68 Productions. Visit them on the internet at www.mika68.com for more information. Friends, remember the Apostle Paul's admonition to the believers meeting in Rome. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I'm your host, Mike Spaulding. Thank you for joining us today for this edition of Soaring Eagle Radio. Thanks for tuning in today to the Soaring Eagle radio program. For more information about the show, write us at Soaring Eagle Radio, 682 West Grand Avenue, Lima, Ohio, 45801. You may also contact Mike directly by email at the following address, Pastor Mike at woh.rr.com. God bless you today.